are you and and how okay so last time i talked to you it was like was it four weeks postpartum exactly like where are you now how many weeks it is five and a half weeks yeah okay at least six weeks on on wednesday okay you didn't remember wednesday mornings yeah yeah you're so chill and i was looking at your your website and before we get into your birth stories I am so curious on you were talking about because you hold a lot of community circles and offerings and and you were talking about not all circles are red tent style not mm -hmm. all women want every type of circle and I've heard of red tent I actually don't exactly know what it is can you share what you mean by that yeah I feel like it's <laughs> it's the perfect place to talk about maiden wounds and mother wounds and sister wounds and all of those <laughs> Um, I started going to a women's circle that was from the red tent lineage is probably the best way to say it. Um, when I was still a maiden, so I was in my early twenties and the, the whole movement started because of Anita Diamant's book, the red tent, and I hadn't read it. I had no inclination to read it. I was still working through, um, recovering from Christianity at the time and it's like the best way I can put it it's like a recovering Christian turned pagan um and I wasn't in a space where I wanted to read about Old Testament women which is what the book is about it's a fictional account of these matriarchs in the Bible that are really really famous so the the wives essentially of the founding fathers of Judaism and the the is the nation of Israel. So the women are Rachel and Leah and um, their mothers involved. And they talk about the lineage of Sarah and Rebecca and all of these women who are like hugely important in that biblical timeline as retreating into a literal red tent during their moon time. And it being a space where you can go for nourishment and for relaxation and for being left alone. And one of the wives, because there's like concubines, because the culture um, really doesn't like men. So she's in there all the time praying to the goddess. And um, the other ones, um, there's one who like really likes men and she's the one who bears him the most sons. And she loves it because she gets to spend her postpartum there. So I love that you brought up postpartum because that's what the tent was for it was for spaces where women would go and the other ones would bring them meals and they would be able to rest and relax and feel nourished and not forced to do all the housework that they normally do so the the lineage then presented itself as saying okay we're going to um revive the idea of this kind of woman's circle where women will gather at the new moon, because that's when we used to all bleed at the same time. And we will spend time talking about whatever it is we're going through. And different circles are run in different ways. The one that I went to, it was always um, a very, uh, mm, I would say it was the same structure every time, but we were in a different woman's home every time. So we got to really have a community because we were in these all these houses from around the the city it was, I was in LA at the time and the main format was you arrive you put whatever potluck dish you brought into the kitchen you go sit in the circle there's a bowl instead of a talking stick because we're women not men um so <laughs> pass the talking bowl each woman would introduce herself say like okay this is where I'm at in my bleed or in this or in that of my cycle and um there would usually be a topic like um okay because this month is June and we're in the season of cancer, we're going to talk about uh, mothers and like how you relate to that. And that like just open ended topic, nice and short. And then we would ask that the shares be pretty brief um, and that we would let each woman share first and then have conversation, which is, I think, a great format because women can talk forever <laughs> and then we would maybe do like a craft or something occasionally 
um, like sometimes we would make cute little jars that like held the intention or we would, we made flower crowns one time, that kind of thing. And then we would, do you want to drink more or are you all done? All done. No? Okay. Um, we would just eat and potluck at the end. And when the main woman who started that particular circle was present, she would also draw a tarot card and talk about astrology while we were all eating. So it wasn't like this formal presentation thing. And that format of circle really heavily focused on womb connection and on that, what the red tent stood for. And that's what I inherited from it. Nowadays, um, I don't recommend people go to the red tent site because they're very into the gender ideology culture that's happening. And I was like, okay, I don't want, I'm going to dissociate myself from that. That's yeah. not part of my way of relating. I would much prefer to be in a space that's for women with wombs and who are born with wombs and who continue to have them. Amen. <laughs> and, yeah. So it was, it was really interesting to see that on their website when I started making my own website, cause I was going to link it and say like, Hey, if you want to learn more, Oh, never mind, Don't go learn more. They're crappy now. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they were always, um, promoting the gender ideology or if that's just been a recent development because like I said it's been years um but there's there's other kinds of circles I've been to too that are more like based on goddess um spirituality or that are more um interested in like doing magic that has to do with the moon so like a full moon circle or a new moon circle that looks at the astrology and then everybody kind of does a ritual together and there's just so many different formats and then plus now I know about village prenatals from sister Morningstar and Emily and yo and that's another type that's totally different because it's not the same as a birth trauma processing circle yeah wait so would you say red saying calling a circle red tent is kind of like saying Kleenex instead of tissue like you know what I mean I would say like yes and no because okay. if the intention is to connect to the book and to that story of literally going into the red tent every new moon together and being away then it it really is Kleenex right it's like that's the point versus um all the other ones are tissue okay <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I I would love to get back into the flow of that because I think it's wonderful for women who are bleeding um, because they're either maidens or they're past breastfeeding or they haven't reached menopause yet to be able to gather once a month at the new moon and really sync their cycles so that they're in flow, in rhythm with natural progression of things. Because that time for a woman, I believe is like the most intuitive time. And then for magical purposes, like everybody who does any type of magic, whether that's just manifestation or witchcraft or Kabbalah or you name it, the new moon is the time to set new intentions and to really hone in on what it is we want to bring about. So they go hand in hand. And if we're bleeding at the full moon, it's a, it's a totally different energy. It's not bad. It's just a different way of looking at things. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So when you mentioned that not every woman wants, um, what did you say? Every type of circle, you mean like, like putting everything in one, like in one session or like, okay. Like I learned that the hard way I was doing my absolute best to try and cram everything into one circle. It's like, okay, we're going to create sacred space with this. And then we're going to have a journaling prompt. And then I'm going to lead you through a guided meditation. Now here's your cacao. And then we're also going to do some dance movement. And here's some time to share, but you only have two minutes because it's supposed to be two hours. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. It's like, it's like seven hours later. Yeah. Yeah. Total. And then, you know, it's funny because, because I only do it once a month. I do want to do so much because I want to spend so much time with these women. And there's only so many things we could do with so many women. And then you next thing you know, it's already been two hours, but yeah, because for me, yeah, I, I like incorporating like mobility because I think it's important for us women to move our bodies and just, you know, move in different ranges of motion that we haven't been. 
and just taking care of our body in that way. Um, but yeah, so I also read, yeah, so you had a home birth. No, first you had a birth at a midwifery birth center. Mm -hmm. And then you had, is it with your second son, you had a home birth with a medical midwife. Yeah. And then your third birth was a free birth. Yeah, and a wild pregnancy too. And a wild pregnancy. Yeah. Wow. So the, yeah. It's like this birth. Hi, Bob Weiss. Um, he was, it was like third time's the charm for everything, where the first pregnancy was really challenging. The, the very first section was fine with um, me knowing I was pregnant, me trusting, me intuitively saying it's a boy. There was this moment where I felt like I was about to miscarry around like eight or nine weeks. And I had thought maybe it was a girl until that point. And then I was like, no, baby, I want to keep you, baby. I love you, baby. Like, please stay, baby. I'm like, I'm so excited to be your mom. I've seen you in ceremony so many times. Like, please stay. And I mean, if you really don't, okay, I get it. But I'm just so excited for you. Please don't go. And I felt something shift. I felt like a different soul come in. And I was like, oh, I'm having a boy. Okay, cool. Maybe that's why you wanted to leave. Because I thought it was a girl. I don't know. And I was just like letting it go. I had um, an interview with a home birth midwife, uh, a practicing one. So not a CNM, but the CPM. Um, I hadn't heard of free birth at the time. So I was just looking for home birth. And during that interview, she was at my home. She brought her um, apprentice and my husband was there too. So it was a lot of people for that first like get to know you session. And my husband was like, I want to know if it's a girl or a boy, because I think it's a girl. And she says it's a boy. And I was like, just trust me. And I'm not doing ultrasounds. <laughs> and How did you know? Not Why didn't you want to do ultrasounds? What did you know about ultrasounds at that time? Uh, I believe oh, it was two things. So first I heard Ina May Gaskin decrying them. And because I had obsessively watched the business of being born when I was 21 and not wanting kids. I just wanted to know about the whole system and then when I moved to Phoenix in 2015 um I met a body worker who like for people who believe in light beings and Pleiadians and all of that he's straight up one of them it was amazing and um he like took one look at me and said, you're too yin. You need to stop being vegan and start eating some bone broth now, like, and put socks on your feet <laughs> like just right away. Instantly didn't have to even touch me. And he looks at everyone's astrology charts before he allows them to be a client, which is amazing that he's like looking to the stars first rather than just the person. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, um, don't do ultrasounds. You don't need them. And I was like, I, I, already don't want to do them but thank you <laughs> and so I was really against it I was like I don't want to do it just to find out if the baby's a girl or a boy that's ridiculous um why put them through that and so the midwife as we were doing the interview said well you can do a test like a blood test and find out through that and it'll just tell you if it's a girl or a boy and we we're like oh what a great opportunity sure let's do that so she drew my blood that day and because she came with her midwife bag, <laughs> big black doctor's bag. And two weeks later, I get a phone call from her that says, I need to talk to you in person. And I was like, is it a girl or a boy? And she's like, I need to talk to you in person. And I thought, well, what the heck? Like, can't you just tell me? And she started crying and was like, there's all this horrible stuff. You have to come down and meet me. Um, I'm at the hospital with my mother who's having like some sort of issue. And so you have to come meet me at the hospital for me to tell you all the sad things that came back in the report. And I was like, what the heck? And she's like, your baby girl's going to die. And that's what, like, yeah, so I don't, anyway, <laughs> we go down, we sit down with her. She's like bawling. She hands over this paperwork and it turns out she didn't just check the baby's sex. She did a full genetic test without my consent without my knowledge I didn't know she was doing full genetic testing I thought what's, she was what's um BPP is that different do you know what I'm talking about mm -mm. okay yeah. never mind okay go on so the because I I did 
a blood test for the Y chromosome with this little guy to prove to my husband that yes, I am a boy mom and this is another boy. Because I knew instantly it was another boy. I know my body, I know my babies and I have strong intuition. So <laughs> anyway, the midwife, she hands over all this paperwork that we don't understand. It has all this genetic stuff on it and she can't even read it that well. We find out later because she tells us that our baby has trisomy 13 that they won't survive outside the womb and that we should abort. And then she proceeds to say, you can just go to Planned Parenthood. They won't ask questions about how far along you are. And I was like, what? No, I have a healthy baby. I know my baby's fine. Like what? I think they just got my blood work wrong because it says girl and I'm having a boy. I know I'm having a boy. So we had um, in a little bit. So thank you. When we had uh oh talk ourselves we're like no we're we would carry to term I think like I don't and at the same time like I don't want the baby to suffer okay so maybe we should abort if the baby's going to suffer because that's not fun and and we were really confused we had just gotten together <laughs> brand new parents first time parents and so we went to a specialist who like deals with abnormalities and terminations who it's not about like just wanting an abortion. It's about like medical illness. And they did an ultrasound and I was so pissed because that's like the one thing I didn't want. And the lady said, your baby looks perfectly healthy. Something's wrong. And so she sent us straight to the, the head doctor who took a look at our paperwork. And he's like, yeah, um, one, the midwife read these papers wrong. Don't like, she said trisomy, it's monosomy that's flagging on the paperwork. And with monosomy, you would have miscarried at about eight or nine weeks. So that sensation I had of like, I'm going to miscarry was at the same time that I would have had the baby had monosomy. And he's like, also, um, from the ultrasound, it doesn't look like a girl. So I want you guys to go to a genetic specialist because something's weird. Either they mixed up your blood, which technically could happen, although that's really rare, or something else is going on. We don't know. And um, we were in a fear state. So we went to the genetic specialist who then did amniocentesis. <laughs> and for anybody who doesn't know what amniocentesis is, they get a 12 inch needle. They stick it through the mother's abdomen, into the womb, into the amniotic fluid, and they draw about five vials of amniotic fluid out of that space. Only they had to stick it in three different times because they couldn't get it into the right spot for me. And you have to sign paperwork ahead of time that just that procedure may cause a miscarriage because you're crossing the barrier of the amnion and it might accidentally puncture the placenta because they can't quite tell where it is. So there's <laughs> it's Dang. horrible. Dang. And how many weeks are you at this point? I was 14 weeks. Okay. And I was trying not to ball my eyes out and hold still at the same time, because if you move, it could kill the baby. And they have a giant screen up on the wall where they're all watching to make sure that the needle doesn't touch the baby. And the baby's head is like here and the needle's here. And it's, oh, it was horrible. Plus it, it's painful. And I was sore for the next few days, like crying sore. Oh my terrified God. that baby was dying. Is, is amniocentesis the only sure way to find out some? These genetic maladies. They needed the baby's full DNA. Oh. So they needed the baby's DNA, not mine. And that's in the amniotic fluid? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know I know. I don't know if I believe in science. This is all that yeah, they told yeah. me. <laughs> so they drew it out. They did a chromosomal analysis and then they did a full DNA array where they break down every single line to look for where the anomaly might be. And that takes roughly four weeks to process because there's a lot on a DNA chain. The chromosomal analysis was like, okay, we're not quite sure why it's still coming up girl. It, ultrasounds are obviously showing boy and I was like I know it's a boy well I don't know what's going on so my husband and I went and sat in an ayahuasca ceremony and during that ceremony my husband got this vision that it looked like I mean you see a lot of things during ayahuasca ceremonies but he was seeing the spiral helixes and then he saw one branch break off 
and a new branch that was a different color blew in to that spot. And I had this premonition after the ceremony was finished. Um, I threw up separately from everybody else and it was all clear. I was like, oh my gosh, that was the illness. That's what was wrong. That was the stuff that was coming up on the, the red flags. My baby's totally fine. That's gone now. And we got a call on the way home from where we were. We were in Joshua Tree. And the genetic specialist was like, I can't explain this, but it's like there was a chunk of DNA that went away and a new chunk came in and it was the exact sequence needed to make a boy. Like it stopped being a, a girl X chromosome because it's the entire Y arm just plugged in. So like everything about him is a boy, even though the two X's are showing up because it's actually a Y arm. And my husband was like, that's what I saw. And I was like, I knew it was a boy. And like, holy crap, if we had done a wild pregnancy, none of that would have been. We would have just had our boy because he is, he's healthy. He's about to turn seven. And he's very much a he, um, like in every level, we didn't try to condition him. Like maybe like the girl stuff is in there and we walked him through the toy store and we're like, Let, let's see where he goes. And he beelines for the trucks and the loud noises and the, the, like all of the gender normative boy stuff. Yes. Just, he's obsessed with cars and with racing and airplanes and trains and all the things. So we were cracking up we're like, yeah, he really is a boy. And um, the rest of that pregnancy, so that was about 20 to 24 weeks that we kind of settled in. From that point on in the second trimester, I felt great because then I didn't have people poking and prodding me. I wasn't doing ultrasounds. It wasn't this weird time. I was like, okay, now I can finally get to enjoy being pregnant and celebrate it. And at the same time, um, no home birth midwife would take me as a client because they would lose their license in Arizona for taking on someone who had had that type of genetic testing because I was considered high risk. What? And, and there was, was no way to like tell them I didn't do that. I mean, you didn't want to lie like, or like, yeah, I, I, well, because it was like in my records. So if they transferred care from anybody else, which they had given me an OB at the time to do all that genetic specialty, uh, specialty stuff, because I was on state insurance. And so like everybody knew all they had to do is like pull up my paperwork because they're all part of the system. It's all still part of the system. Mm -hmm. And that was the frustrating part I didn't realize. And if I had known about free birth, we would have just free birth because it was the easiest birth. For a first time mom, I had my waters break after a Trevor Hall concert at 3 30. <laughs> oh my god, you're at a concert. And how <laughs> many how many weeks do you think you were? Um uh, I, I know it was because I know the day I can okay. see. Okay. I was 39 and a half weeks and I was dancing my butt off singing to Trevor Hall and loving every minute of it. And people kept saying, ma'am, do you want a chair? Ma'am, do you want to sit down? Ma'am, you look like you're going to have the baby. <laughs> I'm like, I'm fine. And I had giant box braids at the time. So it was like all this hair, all this belly, all this woman. And I was just enjoying my life. How beautiful. So yeah, the, the waters broke and the midwife at the birth center, because the birth center had an OB. So I was able to be there even though they had midwives on call um she didn't believe me she's like no like you you wouldn't have your waters break beforehand you have to come in and we're going to test the ph and then you can go home at 3 30 in the morning okay great so we go and then she's like okay i have to do an ultrasound to make sure baby's head down because we can't take a breach we'll have to transfer you so i was like i can feel his head in my pelvis <laughs> No, why trust the mother? Is, isn't that funny that even at a home birth, at, at a birth center, they are intimidated by breach? It's just really funny. It was ridiculous. So they did it really. She's like, I'm going to be super fast. Okay, the head's there. Like, because she knew I didn't want ultrasounds. And she was actually, out of all of the, the ones on the team, the one I would have picked. And I was so, so grateful that he chose to come because 
she was the only one who didn't baby me or demean me for the choices I was making or treat me like some teenager who got knocked up because I was tattooed. Like I just like, there was a lot of judgment. It was weird. And then I um, went home because I hadn't had any sensation starting. It was just water. So she's like, okay, you have to go into active labor within the next 12 hours. Otherwise we have to transfer you because your waters are open. It's like, okay, great, baby, come now. <laughs> and, uh, went back to sleep, slept in. Wait, so you and- went home, you went home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a beautiful breakfast, danced around the living room because I could feel sensations coming on. And I had messaged her and I was like, yeah, it's starting. And she's like, oh, good. Thank God. We'll put it down on the paperwork is starting now, even though it was like nothing. It was barely period cramp level. And around 1230, she was like, just come on in so that we have it on the record that you're in within that 12 hour span. Like, okay. And then she said, okay, we're going to have to do some antibiotics because you tested positive for GBS. And um, so let's put those in. And my veins kept rolling. My body was literally rejecting the needle. And they're like, okay, we, we attempted five different times to get this needle to stay in you and it won't. So we'll just say you had the bag and leave it be in case Wait, you have to transfer. You didn't have GBS, did you? They, well, they swiped me like they always do, you know, how they do the swab um, because it's standard procedure uh-huh. birth center with an OB to have to do the GBS test and it came out positive that day which was at what I don't know 36 weeks like who knows if I still was yeah anyway my body didn't want the antibiotics <laughs> it's just cracking up that it like it was like oh my god it's so painful and like her vein rolled again so it's literally rejecting it and then I was just dancing around and that's when the midwife like really did her job she just left us alone. She could see that I was at the beginning stages of labor. There's nothing for her to do. No reason for vaginal checks, no reason for anything. She's like, when you want the water, let us know. Cause I had a little jacuzzi tub. And for a couple hours, we just danced around. We listened to music. My husband and I laughed and talked. Then we added water. And that baby came by almost nine o'clock that night. It was like just before. So for a first time mom, it was less than 24 hours. It was amazing. And I recall most of it being not painful. It was only when the midwives had me do like these special maneuvers to help my cervix of face fully. And that was ridiculous. What did they have you do? They had me lie down um, on like a massage table and then drape my leg over the side and someone would support it until a sensation came on. And then they would drop my leg during the sensation to stretch the internal ligaments and tendons and muscles and all of it. So funny. The cervix would open. It was so cool. I had to do four on each side and that's it. That's like medieval stuff. Yeah, it's weird. So then we, we went over to the regular birthing area again and they let me be and I just really wanted to be on the toilet that's all I wanted to do and they're like okay get her on a birth stool because we can't see what's happening (laughs) so they put the birth stool right in front of the toilet so I felt like I was in the same area and they got me a mirror and I could see his head and my husband could see his head he's sitting behind me and I caught him mostly myself the midwife helped push him up to me because he had a really short umbilical cord but that was it and so she was great. She was like, okay, your hands are the first hands. Like as far as medical midwives go, she's fantastic. (laughs) And so then I was really adamant for the second birth to have a home birth. And we talked to the doula that we had had during the first birth. And we're like, okay, which, which home birth midwife do you recommend? And she's like, oh, this one, I've been to so many births with her and she's so sweet. And this is the name of the company. And like, you're, you're going to love her. She feels like a mom or a grandma, which is what I was wanting. Cause you were talking about mother wounds. I have a big fat mother wound. And so does everybody who knows my mother. <laughs> <laughs> So I was looking for that wise woman to be present. I was looking for that woman that I could turn to, whose shoulder I could cry on, whose arms I could snuggle into because I I wanted a mom space and a grandma space. And I wanted that feeling of like, oh, I'm being held by my lineage, like red tent style of like these women gathering together and like bringing it down. And when 
I was going to all the prenatal visits, it felt like that. It felt like family. She like, her football team and my husband's football team were arch nemesis and there was all this joking about it there was a lot of like sweet talks about her family and her kids and um her home was really warm and inviting and that's where we did all the visits until near the end when she came to my home and it's like okay this is gonna go great and then during the actual late ask did did she force or ask you to do any of like the tests like glucose anatomy scan like what was um she did have me do a lot of those and those should have been red flags but again at the time I didn't know that those were red flags to look for she had me um do a date ultrasound because she didn't trust my conception date like no you couldn't have conceived on that date based off of your cycle that was your luteal phase and I was like I'm telling you that was it even my husband knows that that was it like his intuition told him that it was that time and she freaked out because she couldn't find a heartbeat with her um fetoscope and so she's like you need to go get an ultrasound because I think something's wrong I was like oh no not this again so I go get it and I hold up the freaking paper to her I was like I told you I'm only 11 weeks along, not 13. You cannot hear the baby's heartbeat yet. And she was like, okay, fine. Um, then she had me uh, do, she recommended all the other tests with me being able to deny them with the caveat that if I transferred to the hospital, they would treat me as whatever. And I was like, that's fine. I don't feel like drinking poisonous gloop to prove that I'm not diabetic. I don't feel like doing the swab. I'm just going to take extra probiotics um, and <laughs> like just all the things. And then we ended up doing an ultrasound to find out the baby's gender because again, my husband didn't believe me that it was a boy. I'm telling you it's a boy. We didn't, we were so afraid of the blood tests because of what happened with the blood tests before that we didn't want to go that route. We didn't know that there was an option to just check the sex, not do the full panel. And so we did a real quick one that was the anatomy scan, which she would have recommended anyway, but since we were volunteering, she's like, okay, just call that the anatomy scan. And uh, it was a boy because I'm right about these things. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, she was really, really great until during the labor when she was like not liking where I was positioned I was on the toilet again because that's where I'm comfortable and she was older she was a little overweight her knees were bad getting into the bathroom getting on the floor and then checking me was difficult for her so she didn't want me there so she said okay we're gonna move you and I was telling Yolanda this and she cracked up where I said I have this vivid memory of her saying, Amy, snap out of it. I need you to open your eyes and tell me what you're feeling because I can't tell how you're feeling. And that's like how I remembered it. And then uh, I went back and I watched the video uh, almost four years later with that memory in my mind. And she's going like this, Emily. And it's like this soft, sweet, loving voice. But the intention behind it was to pull me out of that beautiful transcendent space I was in. So I remembered the intention. I didn't remember the actual volume, wow. which is amazing how much a mother's sensing in that space that even if we're using these quiet, soft, loving tones, if our intentions are not pure, if it's not truly to check in with her, if it's to get her out of whatever she's in, she's going to know and she's going to remember. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was for me. So it was really interesting to see that and to be able to give her some credit that she wasn't actually shouting at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, in my memory, she was. And she said, okay, we're going to have her stand up. We're going to move her to the bed. So she moved me to the bed and had me lie on my side and told the doula to grab my leg and my husband to grab my head. And like, she was like orchestrating people. And then, um, she was wanting me to push on my side in that position, even though my body didn't want to go there. And she was like, her hand was basically inside of me for the last seven minutes of that labor. 
where she was like feeling for his head, feeling for my cervix, swiping around. She said, okay, I'm going to push his head up a little bit so we can hear his heartbeat better on the Doppler. So she's literally pushing the baby back inside my body. It was wild. Um, and I gave it to Yolanda and Emily to use as a case study because the video makes me want to vomit watching what Who's she's recording doing. recording it? Uh, the doula's apprentice. So there were a lot of people in that room. <laughs> my husband, the midwife, the midwife's apprentice, the doula, the doula's apprentice, a friend of ours who was taking photos and then someone who's watching our older son. So it was, it was crowded. And she started to say, you got to get this baby out, push, push. And then everybody around me started chanting like loudly, push, you can do this, shouting in my face. And I'm going, ah. and as the baby comes out, she starts yanking on his head, like full on grabs him around the neck and just pulls as hard as she can. It was so sad. She's like pulling him out of my body. And then she said, grab your baby. Like shoved him up towards my chest. And then she's like, oh my gosh, you did so good, sweetheart. Oh, and it was like this like weird grandmother tone again. And I, I was like, oh, this is something's wrong. I don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. And started investigating a little bit and found Free Birth Society during that postpartum and was just heartbroken because I knew that for the first two pregnancies, I had had options, but I didn't know. I, I could have made other choices, but I wasn't aware of them and really spiraled down for a little bit with that awareness. And I had to stop listening to the podcast because it's just so sad that I didn't get the births that were possible because I hadn't done even more research than I thought was necessary. Did any part of your mind say, like, try to dismiss it? Like, well, you did have a natural unmedicated birth. Like, did that, did that cross your mind or not? Because that wasn't like the main goal anyways, right? You were kind of just doing what you wanted to do. Like, right. That wasn't a goal goal. So did that not cross your mind or did it? A, a little bit. I was like, oh yeah, I had a birth center birth and it was totally natural and it was really ceremonial. We were singing songs and drumming. It was beautiful. And I caught him. And that was the story for the first one. And then the story for the second one was it was only three hours and it was like an ayahuasca ceremony because I was throwing up and singing and like going in and out of this trance state. And then um, he had shoulder dystocia. So the midwife had to help. That was how I wrapped my head around it for the first year was she told me he had shoulder dystocia that's why she moved me there which for anybody who knows anything about shoulder dystocia that's the worst position to put a mother in she should have had me on hands and knees or lunging or something and no like she, it, he didn't um she said that she didn't realize it until the end when she was pulling on him and so my story was okay she she had to do that because in her medical expertise she recognized something that was needing her involvement and so okay she did what she had to do and my let's see oh, about a year later we had met some new friends and one was a body worker and chiropractor and all of that kind of thing we invited them over to our home and my second son who had been yanked on just toddled over to him like he could barely walk and he crawled up onto his lap and turned around and touched his neck like please help and like, he knew and so we were all crying like oh my gosh this poor baby who got yanked on he's like fix this fix this and to this day that chiropractor still does body work for all of us and and he does way more than chiropractic he does cranial sacral and energy stuff and all of it and my son's love it they can feel like the the hands nurturing them but he knew instinctively like I have to get something adjusted because my entrance into the world was very violent um and that's when I started to question the story and that's when I was starting to feel more of an advocate space and I found out that midwife retired right after me and if she hadn't, I would have been much more vocal. I would have told a lot more women. The other midwife who misread the paperwork, um, I have warned other women away from. And I don't want to name names here because it's a whole other thing. And I've, I've had friends who've birthed with her and had good experiences. Um, 
that being said, if someone's like, oh, I'm considering, I'm like, well, you might want to stay away from this person. And here's why. And the minute someone hears that she told me to kill my baby, that was, <laughs> they're like, okay, we're done. And that's it. So for this last one, I was like, no midwives, no interventions, no anybody. It's just me and this baby. And I started listening to the free birth podcast again at the beginning of last year. 2022 because I was consciously conceiving so we were waiting to conceive until we felt ready to welcome baby in and talking about it a lot as a couple as parents and then when we said okay we're ready we got pregnant like boom right away which was wonderful and it's, like, it's a boy I know it's a boy don't ask and yeah. a, about eight weeks in he was like okay come on though like how do you know it's a boy? What if it is a girl? Like so many people were like, oh, you're going to get your girl. I, was like, I don't care if I get a girl or yeah. not. Like, By like, the way, you mentioned before, you're an only child. And so is Anton. Yeah. Yeah. So for him, he's like, oh no, another one. <laughs> more, give me more. We were the opposite kind of only children where I wanted all the siblings and he was very content with where he was at. And I researched and researched and I found a company that I didn't need any middlemen. I didn't need any medical practitioners. I could just get a mail-in thing and they were from the United States. They didn't outsource. Everything was done in-house. Like, okay, if I'm going to send my blood anywhere, this is a safe place. Can and you share what that is? What company or, um, I mean, is it because I've seen places where, yeah, like you order a test online, right? Then you drop it off at a specific place that they do lab no like it's like a out it's not in a hospital but it's its own standalone thing right this one it's in Ohio let me see oh, and so you mail it and then they mail you or they email you the yeah they emailed it cool I don't know if I could find it back yeah, here it's all good but that yeah letting women know that that's an option they don't have to go into you know, see an OB or a nurse, you can no, do it on your own. Anybody involved at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, if I find it, I'll send it to you and then you can post a, a link. Okay, cool. Okay, here. Oh, here it is. Um, they're called DNA Diagnostic Centers and they... Their test is called peekaboo. Um, <laughs> it's looking in at but, it. But then how do you draw your own blood? Or you prick? You prick and then you squeeze. So they like have this whole thing about how you wash your hands to get them really warm. And then you rub them really vigorously. And then you like pull down from the elbow and you get a lot of blood in your fingers. And then the prick goes pretty deep. And you just sit there squeezing from the base of the finger until the little vial has as much as it needs and then close it and make sure that no boys touch it because they're only looking for the Y chromosome and that's it. And they don't look for anything else. And if the Y shows up, they say, okay, it's a boy. And if they're wrong, you get your money back. And then I was like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> that's great. And they also, I, I chose this company too, because they do a lot to help people who've been wrongly convicted through DNA tests to prove they're innocent. And um, one of my teachers, Damian Eccles, was in prison for a very long time um, with three charges of murder that he didn't commit and was fighting and fighting and fighting to get out. And he was on literally on death row for that entire time. And um, I don't know, you might have heard of it, the West Memphis Three. And so he fought oh. and fought. And fought. Well, I might have seen a documentary. Is there a documentary? Yeah. And he had so much faith in his spiritual practices and in the people he was in contact with. He was like getting letters from the Dalai Lama. <laughs> like people felt so bad because he didn't do it. And he was adamant that he was innocent. Um, and they finally got DNA proof that he was innocent and that this other person who did it was at large the entire time. And the state didn't want to recognize it because then they would have to give him reparations and they would have to own up to it. And so they would keep shutting down the trial and they keep trying again. 
Um, so this blood testing company helps other people who've been wrongly convicted show with DNA and they'll do it for free for the, the people who are in prison. It's like, okay, that matters to me. So I chose them and it came back, boy. I said, I told you, <laughs> just trust me. The next one, we're going to do full wild pregnancy, not a single test on any level <laughs> because I know. And when I know, I know. Yeah. The, um, that was it. We didn't do anything else. I didn't check any fetal heartbeats. I didn't do any fundal measurements. I weighed myself once or twice just out of the sheer fun of it. Like, be like, oh my gosh, look how big I am. Mm -hmm. Because it's amazing to me that the body can transform and I'm not like trying to watch my weight. I'm just yeah. curious. And at what at what point? So after, you know, you listen to all of these stories and you realized what had happened. Well, it, it um, validated what happened, right? And at what point was it immediate? Like, oh, hell no. Am I going to have another managed birth? Was it automatic or was it like you, you approached Anton, asked him like what he thinks over, like, you know, what was the process like for you to come to that decision? I, I knew I was fully capable of having both of those first babies by myself after the fact. And then when I... Um, really knew I was pregnant. And I told Anton, I took three pregnancy tests because <laughs> it was so early. It kept coming back negative. I was like, I need proof to show my husband. I know you're in there. Just like, come on, enough HCG. Let's do this. <laughs> Showed him. He's like, okay, fine. You are pregnant. And I was like, I'm, I don't want anybody. And he was like, what about a doula? He's like, no, I don't want anybody. He's like, what about the kids? Like, who's going to watch the kids? I'm like, don't worry. I'm going to be laboring during the night. They'll be asleep. You won't have to worry about them. When it's almost time, I'll wake you up. And then when it's really almost time, you'll wake them up and we'll have the baby and it'll be morning and it'll be great. And he was like, you can't plan birth like that. It's like, I can manifest anything, sir. And <laughs> just kept reiterating that we didn't need to bring in a babysitter. We didn't need to bring in a doula because the doula would be there for him, not for me. I was like, you don't need a doula. You're a grown ass man. And he was like, I don't know if I can handle all this. Great. Let's educate you. What are you worried about? I was like, well, what if this happens? Okay. Well, nuchal cords aren't a big deal. Well, what if this happens? Postpartum bleeding isn't actually as bad as they make it sound. Okay. What if this happens? Well, if the placenta does get stuck, here's what we can do. Okay. What if this happens? And it's like every single thing that goes, uh, they go in depth into in the complete guide to free birth. And he wouldn't watch it with me, but he would ask me questions. And once I finished that, I was like, okay, I, I'm meant to help other women do this. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And almost within the same day, I saw Emily post, oh, hey, RBK school's opening. It's like, yes, I'm doing this. And I didn't ask. I was like, I'm going to do this. And he's like, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a free birth. To, I'm going to help other women have free births. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for sharing that because I feel like it is important to, to share with other women, the process, you know, with, with dealing with a, a unsure husband or partner, right? Cause that it usually is the case of having that lack felt, of support. Yeah. He felt so comfortable with home birth because he could focus all of his attention on me and then he could trust that other people were taking care of the towels and the wiping and the water and like all of the little details. And he didn't know how he was going to do that. And then I was like, we don't actually need as much as they were doing. We just like, if, if I'm bleeding on the ground, change the towel. I don't want you sitting there cheerleading me. That's what I didn't like about the first two births. So if you could actually just not talk for most of it, that would be great. And he was like, what? Don't tell me I'm doing a great job. I know I'm doing a great job. If I need you to tell me something, I will voice it. And if I can't voice it, I'll probably signal some other way that I need something. And he was like, okay, cool. And um, it took, I would say, until I was midway through Radical Birth Keeper School for him to feel fully comfortable up until that point he was still like do we need a babysitter do we not do we need to have someone on call and so one of my friends who's a a doula who's transitioning to birth keeping outside the system 
we had on call technically, like, so we could tell everybody that she was on call because his parents were really nervous. My dad was really nervous. My mom weirdly trusted me, but like, what's, what's interesting is with, so from hearing your, your previous births, because for, for me, right, I wanted to free birth because I didn't want the, I guess the risk of having a midwife there, anyone else there other than my husband to prolong the labor or, or affect my, my, my space. But it sounded like for you, because you had fairly quick births, it wasn't a thing that, I mean, I know, I know you're the, the last birth with, with your second, your second birth, it was the aftermath and maybe during, but you know how some women that we hear stories, it's like during the labor, they could just feel all of this like bad juju, mm -hmm. but it didn't sound like that for you because from you wanting now to free birth, because for me, it's like, oh, if someone can affect it, I don't want that, but it didn't seem like that was a big deal for you or like it didn't come up because you had such smooth births. Yeah, I mean, it. Oh, my biggest thing was when did you finish going pee pee and take this off. You don't need to sit in your wet. <laughs> um, hi, sweetheart. He's waking up. So I sat in quite a few ayahuasca ceremonies before I met Anton, and a lot of people are like, "Aren't you worried about other people's energy getting on you?" Or aren't you worried about like there being so much negative energy in the room and that affecting your experience, which is what you just spoke to, like all this other type of energy in the room is going to change how I feel. And I think that's the key to sovereignty is no, I am my own wonderful divine being and there can be shouting downstairs and that's not going to change my thought and my focus. If I've been doing meditation, if I've been doing spiritual practices, if I trust in that flow, and if somebody else is having a purge next to me, then that's their purge. It doesn't have to become mine. I can totally understand it. I can totally be empathetic towards it, but it doesn't get into my system. It's not like sticky or something. And I've always felt that way where I don't need to like sage myself if I'm sitting down next to someone I don't like. <laughs> so for me, during those ceremonies, I was able to just totally tune out the room and be in my own process and my own space. Um, because with that particular plant medicine, Mama Ayahuasca, she comes in waves. And so there would be moments where I was fully into the medicine and the moments where I'd come out and say, oh, look at that. They are playing sound bowls. It wasn't just my imagination. Cool. <sighs> Go back in and then come back out and say, nope, they were playing guitar. That was totally in my head. Cool. And just like be in these moments of total transcendence and deep, deep introspection and like blasting out and then coming back fully. And it mimics the birth process completely without like any detail missing of these moments where the body is racked with this energy of getting something out and then these moments of peace in between and rest and recognizing oh hey i made it through i made it through another one oh let's let's do it again <sighs> i'm like knowing that i wasn't going to die unless i was meant to die and i wasn't going to get lost out in the ethers because I had a very strong grounding cord connected to my body and like trusting and being in that trust space of fully surrendering to the death that ayahuasca brings. And during one of those ayahuasca ceremonies, when I was very much a maiden and dating someone who very much didn't want children, I was convinced I didn't want kids, says the woman holding a baby. And I um, felt this urge to sit in a position with my legs wide open to bring my hands down towards my vulva and my belly felt huge and I remember thinking in the middle of that ceremony oh hell no you're not making me have a baby I'm not gonna have a baby you can't and I shook my fist like to God like you can't make me do this like no I'm never having a baby and then all this pain was coming through and it was awful it was horrendous and I heard this voice that said like surrender 
there's no way out except through just do it I was like okay fine <laughs> and I just relaxed and I felt this energy flow through me and they're like this is what birth can be you can just let it come through and I was like okay fine I'll have a baby and then all of this energy started just like pouring out of me I was purging in like every way you can crying and sweating and shaking and then they're like see it's like it's beautiful isn't it and I was like when is this gonna happen I'm like soon and I'm gonna have a baby soon but the guy and they're like you know I, was like, I know I know he's not the one so it's not with him I'm like oh hell no and <laughs> the spirits were being so loving and kind and just saying you're going to have a baby soon would you like to meet him and I saw my son in ceremony. He's like this beautiful blue, bright spirit. And I was like, okay, I welcome you in. When are you coming? He's like, when you meet the one. And it it progressed that way. So that by the time that I was actually in these birth spaces with strangers, right? Because it was midwife I didn't know too well, her apprentice or her assistant, um, the doula and like all sorts of people. It was the same thing as ceremony. They were just there. They were doing their own thing. I was doing mine. And I was in it. And if I didn't want them, I was very capable of saying, no. <laughs> and I remember growling, no more Clary Sage at the doula at one point. She was trying to help things along. I didn't want the essential oil. So I was still pretty vocal about maintaining that sovereign space. That's so cool that you say that. And, and you just, I've never done any plant medicine before, but even just you saying, it helped you. I mean, like when I think of what you just said, it's like letting go. And with some women that I've talked to, like another pregnant woman, I, I can feel that something is blocked. Yeah. She's attached to some kind of story or thought, which actually seems from my observation, um, her making the decisions she's making. And I know every woman is responsible for their own choices, but I can see that there's something blocking. And if we could just have that practice of letting go, and I know there's like, you have to go so much deeper than that. It's not just saying letting go, but um, not being so attached to certain stories. And yeah, it can definitely show up during pregnancy and how we give birth. And so- Hugely, hugely. If a woman isn't ready to let go of maidenhood, if she isn't ready to process out her ancestral griefs, um, if she isn't ready to let go of her goals and her dreams, and her ideas of what she's going to accomplish in life, then yeah, I would be highly surprised if she had an easy process of birthing because I felt like I was doing all of those things and I still was doing that during birth of like, okay, you're not gonna do this anymore. Now you're gonna have a baby. You're not gonna do this anymore. You're gonna have a baby. And who knows what kind of woman you're gonna be? Who knows what kind of mother you're gonna be? And there's only one way to find out. Let's walk through this doorway. Let's walk through this doorway. And I just kept saying that. And for this sweet little free birth, it was so much gentler and so much more focused. And I think a, a huge component was I was alone. Um, I held to this vision that I described earlier of like, I'm just going to labor through the night. I'm going to crawl to the edge of the bed. I'm going to sigh this baby out. It'll be great. Um, and Anton's like, please wake me up before you have the baby. <laughs> Okay, I'll add you in. I'm going to crawl to the edge of the bed. I'm going to be breathing. You'll wake up. I will sigh this baby out. And then the boys will see him and we'll say, meet your brother. It's going to be great. And he was like, I don't know. Like, we'll see how this happens. And I saw um, pink spotting on Tuesday morning before I had him. And I was like, oh, I'm having the baby soon. And like my sons were walking by the bathroom door when I like pulled out the toilet paper, I was like, oh, and are you having the baby? It's like soon, either today or tomorrow, the day after. And they're like, okay. And it approximately was, how many weeks were you or how did you know how many? I weeks? was just past 40, according to date of conception. And um, so I was like 40 and two days. And it was great. I was like, I could be pregnant for another five weeks. I could be pregnant until tomorrow. And we'll find out. And that whole day, I felt super psychedelic, very ethereal, just in and out of nap times, eating as much as I could. I was like, okay, we're getting ready, getting ready for whatever this is going to be. Uh, yeah, we didn't know if it was going to be a fast time or if it was going to be uh, like the second birth or if it was going to be a little bit longer. And around 1030 that night, I couldn't sleep through the sensations anymore. 
And I recognized that if I resisted them, they hurt more. And if I was like welcoming them, they didn't hurt at all. It was just this beautiful wave of energy and my whole body would like shift with it if I just surrendered. And I was like, okay. So instead of saying like, oh no, here it comes. I have to say, yay. <laughs> I was like coaching myself mm. with singing songs inside my head because everyone was asleep because we have a big family bed, which our dogs sleep in too. So I didn't want to wake them up too soon. So in my head, I'm singing, I'm dancing, I'm doing all the things out loud. It's like, like really quiet and I'm obsessed with this scene from the movie Wanderlust with Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston okay I never saw it it's it's funny it's a good good laugh if your husband and you want to laugh for a little while I love Paul Rudd (laughs) yeah so Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston accidentally end up at this commune in like Carolina North Carolina or South Carolina wait 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 I did see it yeah okay go on go on And there's a woman there who's massively pregnant and Paul Rudd ends up on the porch with her and everybody's talking about free love. And she's like, I just think it's perfect that you're here with me right now. And he's like, oh, 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 like, are we going to do this? Like you're pregnant, but okay. I'm kind of into it. Like Tantra. And then she's like, I'm having my baby. (laughs) It's like, no, we need to call so much. She's like, no, it's the most natural thing in the world. (laughs) She says two things that I replayed in my head over and over and over again. And one is, look at the full moon. It's luminous. And she's like, <laughs> station and is just shouting luminous. And then he's like, stop it. And she's like, there's nothing to stop. My baby's on his journey. I'm opening like a lotus flower. And I kept hearing as I was having these sensations, I'm opening like a lotus flower. And I would like giggle to myself. And that joy, that laughter was there the whole time. And I was like, I wonder, I wonder if I can see the moon. So I opened the curtains to the bedroom, which we have like blackout curtains because our neighbors have lights on all the time. And I opened it and right there was the moon. And I was like, it's luminous. Wow. He's cracking up. And that's when my husband woke up because he felt the moonlight. And he's like, are you looking at the moon? It's like, I am. You want to have a baby with me? So then he got up and he was just kind of present. He was so great. He didn't say a whole lot. Yeah. Big yawn. And um, I moved around, was doing my thing. We put on my ayahuasca ceremony playlist. And that like kicked it into high gear around 4 a.m. And the boys, so my younger son heard me around 4.45 say like, hey, uh, that's that's a loud noise mom is making. I think she's having the baby. So he woke up our older son. He's like, hey, wake up. Mom's having the baby. And they came running into the bathroom. And I like, I love this because the first two births, I was trying to be on the toilet and I couldn't because they kept moving me and this time I was like okay I don't know if I have to poop or if I have to have a baby but I'm gonna go stand over the toilet and I did and sweet husband's wiping the side of me and letting but it's all going into the toilet so he doesn't have to clean it up anywhere else which is nice did you did you throw up during this the I only threw up once as soon as the ayahuasca music came on it was like my body's like oh we're in ceremony <laughs> which is like so notorious for that kind of plant medicine and it was only one time though and it was all water it was very like okay we're just making some space and so I had had some bowel movements but I was able to go to the bathroom and take care of myself and then come back out several times um, because there was so much pressure on the back Um, but it wasn't back labor at all it wasn't painful it was like this just amazing opening sensation of like I could it felt like my hips were literally like pulling themselves apart like if if you do a good stretch in yoga and for for this being your third birth would you say the sensations are very different like how would you describe it I mean you know third time around the first two it wasn't again it wasn't like I would describe them as painful it was only when I was messed with when they were doing vaginal checks or trying to put me in different positions that I described it as painful the rest of the time it was very like just interesting oh that's new I haven't felt that much energy in my tummy before and um there were moments in this one though where I was so disciplined in the surrender that the sounds that were coming out of me sounded like the sounds I make during sex 
not like the sounds I make during birth. And so I feel like I, I reached a new level of pleasure within it. And so it did cool. feel really good when the baby started to come out. I was like, Ooh. oh, this is exciting. And um, I, I feel like it surprised everyone how quickly he came because within that moment of just total surrender I was like I'm just going to open up completely and let whatever wants to come out come out um I could feel the pressure on my cervix yeah and uh I like gave one little like muscular squeeze like an intentional I'm thinking about it squeeze my my body and the mucus plug shot out like a champagne cork I was like okay I'm going to reach in and I, I don't want it to be too soon. So I've been waiting until this point, but I feel the urge to push. So I reach in, I could feel the bags and I was like, okay, I'm going to give one more push. And I contracted my muscles. Wait, when you say reach the bags, does it feel like, I don't know, like a really thin balloon, like of water? Oh. Yeah, it was like, it was bulging out of the cervix and I could feel like water inside the, the, yeah, it felt like balloon, like a latex almost because it's it's tissue so I gave another push and the waters exploded and his head started to descend and I was like I can feel his head and he was crowning and the boys said I can see his head and his head birthed first just by itself um and my husband's like oh my god I can see his ear like he's right there and okay and at this moment you're how what's your position I was standing up over the toilet. Okay. Yeah. Facing, so I, facing toilet? Facing, uh, no, uh, facing away from the toilet. So okay. I had one hand on the toilet seat to brace myself while I was pushing. And then the other hand was reaching in and feeling around and um, holding his head as that came out. And I just was standing for the last like 10 minutes uh, right over the toilet. I was standing almost the whole time though, because I just... I didn't feel comfortable sitting. I wanted to dance and move. And I remember consciously feeling his body inside and thinking, oh my gosh, he's right there. Like that's, I can feel all of him. I can feel him with my hand. I can feel him inside myself and thought, okay, he needs to finish rotating. So I'm just going to give a little like urge with my muscles to help him come down. And, And I felt like I roared, but Anton said it sounded like I went, <sighs> like and I said, oh, I signed my baby out. <laughs> he came out in that one little push, so it was really three pushes, and he was out. And then my husband caught him, and because he came out so fast, he like shot out once I did that, and grabbed him, brought him up to my up to my breast. Yeah, you gave a little cough. You did. Are you telling the story too? <laughs> And he screamed really well. He was a little mucusy, but we just like, I just swiped with my finger and was talking to him and he did totally great. And then the placenta just came out. It was like, Shoop. wow. I had to catch it with my other hand. Did it oh. surprise you? Yeah. I really yeah. thought it was going to take longer because the first two births, um, which this says something, it didn't want to come out. I didn't feel as safe as possible. And they did fundal massage where they're like shoving on my abdomen and yanking on the cord. It was horrible. So I really thought it was going to take like an hour for my placenta to come out because they always had taken that long. And it was within the first five minutes. It just, and I didn't even have to consciously think about it. It just kind of slid out on its own. Amazing. And so then we went to the bed and we rested. He nursed. Yeah. What you looking at? <laughs> Wait, so what did you do with the last, all all the placentas? The first two, um, we did prints on like a big, beautiful paper and then encapsulated them. With this one, we did the print, but we're going to bury it. Oh, okay. But, and they were all lotus births? No, the, the midwives, the first one cut the cord after 15 minutes because they wanted to prove some test thing or other. <laughs> And then the second one, we waited an hour and then they um, cut the cord. And then with this one, Hi. we I wanted to do lotus birds, but our dogs will get into anything. And I mean, anything like they'll lick his poopy wipes. So I was like, if I'm asleep, 
and there's a bowl of meat next to me those dogs will eat it yeah I can't do this bird. so <laughs> I was like okay what's the next best thing so we burned it and we waited two hours to burn the cord and the boys our older sons wanted to help and their arms started cramping like holding it and they're like oh when are we done come on kiddos you have to wait like, no and so my husband and I took over and finished the burning and yeah I think it was a really nice gentle transition for him to have that two hour so beautiful wait. yeah and it healed so fast the umbilical cord that was on him fell off in like two days it was it was everything that I had said in that right oh my god to, like to a T of I'm gonna labor through the night at the end near the end you're gonna wake up then the kids are gonna wake up just in time to meet their brother he's gonna be born at sunrise it'll be great and he was he was born literally like 20 minutes before the sun came on the horizon so it was like that dawn gray time you looking over oh hi Apollo it sounds like you're just so in tune with however you want things to be and being open to that and and it became it's I think the idea of a birth vision is so different than a plan is a vision I'm holding to a lot of possibilities within a certain parameter of like okay this isn't uh negating the what ifs it's not like oh nothing bad could happen but what if everything went right yes yes what are your so what are your thoughts when a woman is doesn't even want to think of the birth vision because it may not go that way so they're afraid that everything's the opposite like I don't know if you've had experience with women who are like, I don't want to think about it. I, I don't want to give it any, any thought because if it doesn't happen or I don't know, do you think there's, there's some kind of attachment then? I, you know? I do think that there's um, like Marianne Williamson says, we're more afraid of our success than our failure. I think there are a lot of women who would then have to contend with being out of the system being out of society's mainstream things. I'm all, I already was doing that as the black sheep of my family. I was totally rebellious when it came to how I um, moved through the world religion wise and social wise, like the amount of tattoos that I have. It's like, I'm not going to do anything mainstream anyway. And I already had distanced myself from the medical system a lot before even my first birth. Um, I had been off birth control for many years at that point. Like there was a lot that I did prior that my psyche allowed for that type of space. Whereas I think women coming directly out of um, pretty standard engagement with the medical system, standard engagement with this is what you do and the order that you do it and the type of house you live in and the type of car you drive and like if they're really engaged mm. societal structure I think it's a lot more difficult to then remove oneself fully and trust that to be the pariah to be the witch to be the odd one out who's the scapegoat for a lot of things because then they would have to question everything else in their lives yeah and and that's a that's a huge psychic shift to be able to sit there and say like oh okay I I don't have to hit these milestones in yeah. order to be approved of. Mm -hmm. That's my yeah. my idea of it anyway. That the surrender comes easier when you've already let go of everything that could be deemed yeah. good or normal or expected. Yeah. Can I can I ask? So you know I've only given birth once. Yeah. How can you compare the healing of your yoni with all three births? Like, does it, because I know obviously the third birth, our, our yonis are never going to be like how it was before our first birth. Yeah. Can you describe the healing or? I feel like, okay, so this is, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm one of those women who's ready to have sex pretty fast, not terribly fast, but before the five week mark for sure. And um, a lot of that 
I think is a really strong relationship to my yoni anyway. Um, I look at it frequently. I engage with it. There's all sorts of beautiful like womb rituals and meditations I've done. And do you do yoni steam? I love yoni steam. Yeah. So that's the big thing is after the first birth, I was really, really committed to yoni steaming. And within two weeks of steaming every day for half an hour with the yoni steam blend that I had inherited from my teacher and made for myself, um, I felt like I went back to having an 18 year old body. Like it was tight. It was difficult to like engage for the first time with my husband. I was like, Oh, whoa, this feels like being a virgin again. Wow. And wow. then after the second one, I didn't steam as um, consistently. It's probably the best way to put it. I steamed, but not as consistently. And there was definitely a longer healing process, but it wasn't, again, it, it wasn't like, oh no, now I'm open forever. Or like, I didn't tear for any of my births, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but there was definitely this same, like, oh, this feels brand new again. It's like maybe along with becoming a new mother, it's like the new yoni is coming through and it feels like being a virgin. It feels like everything is super sensitive and super new and like tight. And I think the yoni steaming definitely, are you talking about it? You didn't know I did that, huh? It's one time I put you down. <laughs> So yeah, my husband and I have already reconnected and it was beautiful and just like romantic and sweet. And we kept making sure that he was really asleep. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm gonna have to hop on that Yoni steam. I got my little Yoni throne um, from Sacral Steam. And so, yeah, I need to hop on that. Yeah. 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 I, my dad makes the boxes. He does carpentry. And so for my business, I can give people these beautiful steam boxes that are they're triangle shaped so if it's not comfortable to sit with your legs super wide you can sit with them a little more closed and um there's a hole in the back of the the box so that you can run a cord through and have the burner and pot system because cool. if you don't have a burner underneath the pot then the steam only lasts about 10 minutes and if you have the burner you can sit there for 30 to 45 minutes and that's really when you get the major effect when you and say burner is it like those single electric burners like yeah. okay okay yeah like a, a just a little like sometimes it says like one, two, three, four, like levels, or sometimes it'll say like medium, low, high or whatever. But they're, they're electric. Like it's like an electric stove. Yeah. And they're really small. They're like just a little tiny electric burner. And then the pot, um, is a one quart pot. So it's a little small pot. And I, for postpartum, no matter what other herbs you put in, always recommend mugwort, nettles, rose petals, and um, one to two white sage leaves. And then if you want to add in other fun stuff like motherwort and chamomile and lavender and um, astragalus for disinfection and what else did I put in mine? Oh, uh, shatvari root, which is an Ayurvedic herb that I once heard called the herb of a thousand husbands, that it makes your yoni so like wonderful that oh. you can handle a thousand husbands. So I was like, oh, oh thank dang. You. <laughs> um, so yeah, Shadvari root, that one's great. Okay, where would I get that? Where does one get that, On, like online? Um, yeah, Mountain Rose Herbs, they're, they're my favorite. I don't have an affiliate link, I probably should. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they have like, such high organic standards that even if it comes from countries that maybe are a little bit questionable um, okay. in terms of their soil content, I know that they've done their due diligence and I trust them. Okay, mountain and Rose then, Herbs. Yeah, Mountain Rose Herbs. Star West Botanicals is also great. Mm -hmm, um, so yeah, I, I buy in bulk. I'll buy like by the pound and make blends for myself and hi for other people. Cool. Hey, talking. So what is one like resource you want to recommend to a first time mom who's thinking of having a home birth? 
other than the complete guide to free birth yeah like, is there a book that really resonated with you that you read I really loved um let me see yeah Laura Kaplan Shanley's um, I love that one because she has like a spiritual component to it yeah and I just highlighted everything yeah I I I, I like that book a lot too. Mm -hmm. That one I, I read so fast. I also think Pushed is really great if they're coming from the medical system because Jennifer Block just does such a good job. Yeah, that's hard to read. I mean, it's it's good. It's just, it's yeah, hard, yeah. It's hard yeah. to read. Um, the Yeah, I feel like unassisted childbirth is probably the best just for personal use. And then if, I guess, um, gentle mothering and gentle birth gentle mothering by um dr sarah buckley is oh is great for talking to family members who mm. are like but why is ultrasound bad and then you can go straight to the chapter yeah, and because of go. her studies and all that yeah she goes i like how she goes both holistic spiritual but scientific yeah she yeah. allows for the the people who really believe in science to have detailed things of like okay here's the hormonal blueprint mm -hmm. here's the cascade of interventions and then she also is like and I love lotus birth because then my child's aura is doing this yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Oh that's what I would, I would definitely recommend those um, great and can you I mean before we get off I just have two more questions like can you share what postpartum like it was like you know even with all three births like briefly in in comparison you know being a third time mama <laughs> yeah, the first one I wanted I had read the first 40 days um yeah which is a great book too and I had this whole dream about what it could be but um it really didn't work out that way family members were like I want to hold the baby and um let's go out to eat and celebrate like, I don't want to go anywhere right now. Um, and then we had a lot of doctor's appointments because he had tongue tie and lip tie to the point that he couldn't drink. Mm. No, it'd be different if like he could latch and then I wouldn't have done anything, but he, he really couldn't latch at all. And he was hiccuping all the time and terrible stomach bloating. So we did the revision procedure. And Is it, do both gets re revised? Yeah. Okay. So they, they cut the frenulum under the tongue and oh, then the lip one. Oh, okay. His lip wouldn't open. Like if I went like this, it stayed. Yeah. Right by the little gums. Wow. Did you so, know that immediately when he was on the boob, like you could just tell, or you were like, you know? Yeah. I just thought the first few days that I was just getting used to breastfeeding and then, um, he wouldn't turn his head to one side. So we went to a chiropractor so he could turn the other way. <laughs> and, uh, she was like, do you know he's tongue tied and lip tied? And I was like, Oh, thank God. That's mm -hmm. why. And so then we went to the pediatric dentist. Mm -hmm. Do you need to go potty? <laughs> that was happening. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Let me. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. With the second one's postpartum, we had a friend who was living with us at the time. So I got the postpartum I had wanted for the first birth, where I was in bed for the first week, in and out of bed the second week, just in the house the third week. We just didn't really go anywhere or do anything, and it was amazing. It was Christmas time. So we just were enjoying like being in the house cozy. And then with this little guy, we didn't plan postpartum very well. And that's something for first time moms that I was just say like, please plan your postpartum in the sense of reaching out to community and really getting that either the meal train going or figuring out which family members are coming when. Because I did have one parent, my dad came out to help for the first nine days. Um, but Anton went back to work right away. And so after that point, we were kind of at our wits end of like, oh, I'm not ready to be out of bed yet. And we have two older kids and meals have to get made and <laughs> the house needs to get cleaned and the laundry needs to get done. And I called uh, that one friend that I mentioned, who's a doula in the system still. And I was like, can you be my postpartum doula? <laughs> and she's like, okay. Mm -hmm cry it out. It's going to be fine. I will come over to the house tomorrow morning. <laughs> and she came, she helped, she organized a few of my other friends to come and just like brush out my hair because it was a tangled mess. Um, and make sure that there was soup in the fridge for me to have warmed up later and someone to take my kids out to like go jump at the trampoline park and 
So it, the third and fourth week, things started to get better. And then by the fifth week, I was feeling strong enough to be doing stuff. And I think that's a really good timeline. Um, that full moon cycle of baby planning to be in bed. Mm-hmm. And then from that point on, gently reintegrating into daily life. And if any first time mom is like, what does that even look like? Listening to the body, I I just didn't want to walk. I wasn't ready yet. My my abdomen hadn't solidified to the point that my back felt okay supporting me. And that's the easiest way I can describe it. It's not like I felt weak or sick or ill, which my mother was like, are you well yet? And I was like, I'm not sick, mom. I'm, I had a baby. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, being in that space of just honoring the body, listening to the body. And if the body's like, go for a walk outside, go do it until the body says, oh, no, no, go lie down. And that's what I did. I walked half a block during, it was exactly three weeks because it was like on a Wednesday morning. I was like, oh, let's go for a walk. And I got half a block away towards the park and was like, yeah, no, never mind. I'm going home. And that was it. And I just went a little bit further every single day until now I can go around the full little circuit that we do in our neighborhood without difficulty and at the same time was massively exhausted yesterday because I went to a birthday party and the car dealership the day before yeah yeah what's Uh, something that would surprise a mainstream conventional person like of something that you did maybe during pregnancy like you know, like for me, it was like raw milk or like eating sushi or something like my sister got like, so like, you can't have raw milk. I was like, I have kombucha too. You know what I mean? Like raw milk, sushi. I didn't do it frequently, but I definitely had two rounds of sashimi during that pregnancy. And um, I think the biggest one is I'm like CPS, don't hear this. Um, psilocybin mushrooms, being able to, um, I microdosed a little bit here and there because of either a headache or wanting a deeper connection or all sorts of things. Um, and then a ton of adaptogenic mushrooms, like I was having reishi, lion's mane, chaga, turkey tail, all of them every single day, if I could help it. And I have this one friend who made chocolates with chakruna leaves which are not normally psychedelic you have to either combine them with the ayahuasca vine or something else that's an maoi inhibitor um because digestively your body just won't pull the dmt out Um, but if they're combined with cacao it's like a very very mild version and i was eating those frequently there were these beautiful little chocolates with all sorts of adaptogens in them um so That to me spoke volumes to how sweet and psychedelic I felt during the third trimester that I was just in this space of, oh, well, yeah, making some sounds. It's hard to yawn and cough at the same time. Um, And I, I felt totally safe with it. And I felt like the mushrooms were speaking to me in this really gentle way of like, you're, you're connected to all of it. And during the first pregnancy with all the craziness, the ayahuasca ceremonies made sense. It was a, it was a healing space for all that went on with the testing. And um, during the second pregnancy, all I had was cacao, <laughs> did the cacao ceremonies. But this third one, I was like, no, he's, he's got something else going on. And we have their placenta prints and the, first baby's placenta looked like a tree which is amazing because ayahuasca vines grow up a tree the second baby's placenta looks like sunshine which is like how it felt being pregnant over the summer with him and then his placenta looks like a mushroom like the way it's shaped and then the bird coming down it's like this beautiful little mushroom oh yeah all the mushrooms I had and I think if the mother's body intuitively says have this we can trust it and if it goes the same with herbs. Um, Kristen Hauser and Ariel De Martinez did a really great little workshop on herbs for pregnancy and postpartum. And what they kept reiterating was, if you go on WebMD, it's going to say not safe because they cannot prove it safe because it's unethical to give 
a random trial to someone who's pregnant who may lose the baby as a result of what you're giving them. And so they can't prove it's safe, but they also can't prove it's not. And it'll say, don't drink hibiscus tea. Yet women in Mexico drink hibiscus tea all the time and they have no issues. So recognizing that herbs and mushrooms and these beautiful plants, um, if our bodies say yes to them, then that's it. And, and it builds that deeper intuition. And I know not everybody has that muscle flexing yet. So if you're like, I don't know if it's a yes or a no, then work on something else until you get a strong full body yes for something. And you understand what that feels like. And then reach your hand out to that bottle of supplements or to the herb that's on the shelf and say like, is this a yes? Is this a no? And, and once that full body yes is established, then there is no question. It's just like, oh yeah, my body wants this right now. I really am craving rose hip tea. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to, do you plan to breastfeed Apollo like exclusively? That's the goal. Um, I, I nursed through my second pregnancy and then tandem nursed both of them for another year and a half after that. Actually, no, two and a half years after that. So my oldest was three and a half and my second was two and a half when we weaned and it was a very teary day for all of us, but my body just wasn't making milk anymore. It's a lot to nurse two babies for two and a half years. Oh yeah. Um, right now he's nursing really beautifully. He seems to be, um, clumping up quite a lot. So I'm not concerned about whether he's getting enough and I'm pouring milk. Oh, dang. Yeah. Um, got a good supply. As long as everything keeps going and I feel nourished, I'm down to nurse this kid till he's three. I think there's nothing wrong with toddlers nursing and especially with the connection that they make and with the amount of good probiotics and other types of vitamins and things that they're getting directly from the milk. Um, that it's, it's probably the best option I can give him. Although I'm not insanely attached because I know sometimes things change and maybe he's two and it stops. And so we'll see. But my, yeah, my goal, my vision is to have that nursing relationship until he's at that three-year-old stage and looking for more independence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have one question about me. So I bought these capsules, these microdosing mushroom capsules, great quality. I bought it. Oh my God. It was two years because I was going to take it. I was, I wanted to microdose before I got pregnant and then I got pregnant and then I just didn't want to microdose. You think it expired? Does that stuff expire? It's been two years. I feel like it. Capsules. I mean, it's dehydrated, right? Yeah. So don't quote me on it, but I would say the potency goes down. Yeah. That's the only thing. They're so expensive. I, I can't... mean, and at this point, like, what would it hurt to take one and see if you feel benefit? And if you do, then let it be. And if you don't feel a benefit, then clearly here, uh, the expiration date happened yeah. or your body doesn't want it. Yeah, okay. Oh, thank you so much, Amy, for taking the time out of your Saturday to share Thanks your story. For having me. This is super fun. I'm really, really grateful. I hope that it helps someone else not have the same story of my first two. If I can prevent that, then job well done.